Welcome again everybody to the Mythic Landscape and American Empire 1898 to 1902. Let me draw the slideshow up here for us. I've decided to break this lecture down into two parts uh, so that each one is sort of manageable in length. I generally would like to keep each lecture segment to about 25 minutes or so, but what I've realized in doing the last few lectures is that taken as a whole they often go longer than that because they're geared to classes that generally run 80 minutes. So I think I'm going to break them up a bit and, and we'll try here today the mythic landscape in American Empire 1898 to 1902 part one. And this lecture is uh, designed to help you with the work you're doing now uh, on your second American History Journal assignment. Let's start out with some questions for history this time. Uh, questions that we'll try to answer as we move through the lecture. Question one, what is America's great mythology? All human cultures create mythology. What is America's great mythology? How has this mythology influenced our preference for political leaders? Trying to tie in a connection here with what I'm calling the great American mythology and our political culture. Question three, how did America's mythology influence its foreign policy in the late 1800s? In particular, question number four asks, how did the Spanish-American War put the mythology to the test? And five, what basic criticism has American foreign policy generated in our own time? We we'll start out here with the great American mythology. Note the definitions of myth. A myth is a traditional story, especially one concerning the early history of a people. A myth can be construed as a widely held but false idea. And finally, an exaggerated or idealized conception of a person or thing. And I think all three definitions have various elements of truth regarding mythology. And so I submit to you here Exhibit A, a famous photograph of recent President George W. Bush from 2003 as he landed aboard the USS Lincoln, an American aircraft carrier, uh, on an occasion to announce the end of major military actions in Iraq. This was the famous mission accomplished photo opportunity where Bush came into the uh, arena here in the most dramatic fashion aboard an American fighter plane. <clears throat> now as you look at the image uh, we begin to uh, interpret its mythic components and carry them forward in our understanding here in our study of American mythology. Uh, but basically what we want to know is why would the White House staff, Bush's advisors, his political managers, have arranged for this particular photo opportunity? What was it about Bush's appearance that was supposed to resonate with the American people? Well to help us answer that question and to shed light on American history, we can go back to an earlier mythic image, this one of Colonel Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders on the occasion of America's victory in another war, the Spanish-American War of 1898. Here they were posing on the island of Cuba following the surrender of the Spanish and their victory in what was called the Battle of San Juan Hill. Within a short time, America would come to know Roosevelt as a household name, a hero of the war, the Rough Rider, uh, memorialized in photograph but also here in music, the charge of the Roosevelt Rough Riders, popular music, uh, stories, poems, uh, y you name it. Eventually his head sculpted on the Mount Rushmore Monument in South Dakota. Again, we want to ask, what is it about the image that, uh, that caught the fancy of the American people, the American public? The name Rough Rider, which the press had 
sort of tagged Roosevelt's uh, cavalry regiment in the Spanish-American War. The name Rough Rider uh, seems to have come from another uh, setting, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Congress of Rough Riders of the World was a popular traveling show featuring a parade of costumed riders on horseback in the late 1800s. Scenes of the Western experience were depicted featuring a company of Wild West cowboys as they were billed. Some were cowboys, others were actors and various unemployed types who hooked on with Bill Cody's Wild West show including sometimes authentic Native American people who were likewise paid to be part of the cast. Buffalo Bill himself played the role of General Custer in the show's finale, depicting what they called Custer's Last Stand. So basically, this was a traveling uh, troupe uh, of performers who, to the <clears throat> delight of Western audience, or excuse me, of Eastern audiences, uh, depicted scenes of what were supposed to be Western history, uh, playing off the <coughs> uh, popular support of the dime novel publishing industry, publishing industry that had arisen in the East, which likewise uh, sort of mass published uh, stories of the Wild West. Uh, again, mostly for the consumption of Easterners who had never traveled to the West, but who were living out a kind of escapist fantasy, you might say, from their otherwise cooped up Victorian urban Eastern existence. And so all of this had tremendous dramatic appeal uh, and was very popular. Buffalo Bill not only toured more or less constantly throughout the Eastern states, uh, but then uh, took his show overseas and toured... Uh, uh, for paying audiences uh, in England as well. It was said that even Queen Victoria uh, attended one of the Wild West shows. The dime novels, as I mentioned before, were quite popular, usually written by Eastern authors, again, most of whom had no direct experience with the West that they described. Here we see the fighting trapper, Kit Carson, now, Kit Carson was, of course, a real Westerner, a historical person, uh, a trapper, uh, a scout. Uh, but in his mythic imagery here, as a kind of fictionalized hero of the West, uh, acknowledging what was often a violent theme to these Western stories. Uh, in this case, uh, Carson manages the unlikely feat of killing two native people simultaneously, one with each hand with knife thrusts, uh, wearing his coonskin cap and his buckskin uh, uh, knee, uh, knee boots and, and tunic here. Uh, he is the very epitome of the mythic image of the Western frontiersman. What one historian has called the gunfighter nation uh, refers to the popular appeal of the frontiersman as gunfighter, as Indian fighter, as wilderness tamer. It was something inherent, I think, in that idea of taming a wilderness that so uh, appealed to Easterners who lived, after all, not in a wilderness, except maybe in an urban industrial wilderness, but, but instead in, in a refined society, an already tamed society, and thus hungry still for the fantasy, the escapist fantasy of taming a frontier. Others like Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, uh, and many, many more in the age of the dime novel will come to represent this, this sort of virile fantasy of taming a frontier. The historian Frederick Jackson Turner gave voice to this in a slightly different way in 1893 when he wrote uh, what has since become one of the most um, influential historical essays uh, called The Significance of the Frontier in American History. This was for the American Historical Association meeting in 1893. Turner, who was a University of Wisconsin historian, said that the American social development has been continually beginning over again on the frontier. This perennial rebirth, this fluidity of American life, this expansion westward with its new opportunities, its continuous touch 
with the simplicity of primitive society, by which he meant, of course, Native America, that all of this furnished the forces dominating American character. The true point of view in the history of this nation, Turner wrote, is not the Atlantic coast, it is the Great West. The frontier is the line of most rapid and effective Americanization. So to understand Turner, you have to imagine the American, the Anglo-American, the English-speaking, Christian, worshipping American civilization line moving rather constantly westward. The original west of the Appalachian, eventually the far greater west of the Trans-Mississippi, as depicted here by John Gast. We've already seen uh, the John Gast uh, painting narrated uh, in an earlier lecture, and you'll recall that the very elements touch upon the mythic qualities of the American Western landscape. Most simply, that Liberty here herself, representing that line of frontier expansion, bringing with her the kind of heavenly light of civilization to illumine the darkness of a wilderness. And so it was true that the U.S. territorial growth reflected a kind of steady progression. I tell my students sometimes that this map of America reminds me of those children's puzzles uh, that, that we do as, as, as youngsters or, or we, that we give to our kids where there's only maybe five or six pieces total, each of them color-coded and unmistakable. It kind of looks like the map here. You have sort of the original extent, the 13 colonies, along with the post-revolutionary claims in the Ohio Valley, Florida, now the Trans-Mississippi West, the, the Louisiana Purchase, Texas, and the so-called Mexican Session, California, Nevada, Utah Territory, uh, the Oregon Country, the Northern Plains, all of it forming kind of jigsaw puzzle map representing America's territorial growth. In other words, what in the 19th century was sometimes termed manifest destiny. But missing from the John Gast painting and often missing from the mythic storytelling tradition is the basic recognition that every single one of these puzzle pieces of territory from the 13 colonies to Florida to the Louisiana Purchase or Texas, the Mexican Session or the Oregon Country was essentially made good uh, that is consolidated by the United States government through a process of military conquest. And it wasn't the cowboy, it wasn't the fighting trapper, Kit Carson, that did the job of military conquest. It was the United States military, whether in its many wars, including the Revolutionary War, including the Seminole Wars in Florida in the 1830s, certainly the Mexican War of the 1840s. And even though at the time we acquired these territories from both Oregon and France, we did not fight actual wars with either of those imperial powers, but instead, as we saw in our lecture on the native landscape, brought the U.S. military in for, I guess, what we could call mop-up operations, first on the Northern Plains against people like the Sioux, and then later as I'm having you read in chapter one of American Realities uh, against the Nez Perce. So essentially every square inch of this formidable territory was ultimately consolidated and somehow claimed, and those claims made good, by military operations. And yet we tend to cloak that legacy of military conquest in the gunfighter mythology. In Hollywood, of course, the movies, the Hollywood westerns, uh, sort of celebrity heroic characters like John Wayne. In politics, it's a popular motif. You'll recall from 2008, the presidential election, Senator McCain styled his campaign and his own political style as that of a maverick. After all, Senator McCain, representing the state of Arizona, a famous Wild West state, seemed to have the persona of the maverick. 
Now, of course, even a cursory understanding of Mr. McCain's career reveals that far from being the outsider that he liked to depict himself as being, he's a career Washington politician serving 30 years as a senator from Arizona. And though Arizona, in our mythic memory, represents the Wild West, Mr. McCain himself was not actually a native of Arizona, but moved there later in life. He was born and raised on the East Coast as part of an established naval family. His father and grandfather had been admirals in the U.S. Navy. He himself uh, was given the finest Eastern education, attending Annapolis or Naval Military uh, uh, Academy, and yet a maverick. And you'll recall he chose as his running mate Sarah Palin of Wasilla, Alaska, whose chief credentials seemed to be that she too was a self-styled maverick from the last of our frontier states uh, and can boast of moose hunting and, and uh, suitable frontier uh, pastimes. Certainly not the only political team to ever try and exploit this. You'll recall that uh, President Reagan uh, president of the United States in the 1980s, well, had been a longtime Hollywood actor who appeared in, among other movies, Ronald Reagan, starring, as you see here, in Law and Order. Law and Order, a rollicking Western adventure from Dodge City to Tombstone. John McCain's Arizona, Tombstone, gracing the cover of American Cowboy magazine, and as he was frequently shown during his political career, at home on his Santa Barbara ranch, as it was usually called, it was a it was a uh, a large spread of real estate purchased for Reagan by wealthy Republican supporters, and uh, Mr. Reagan enjoyed uh, his time upon his Santa Barbara estate, sort of playing the role of Western cowboy as he did in the movies, chopping wood and riding his horse. Mr. Reagan was from Illinois originally, was a transplanted Westerner, was a Hollywood actor, not an actual cowboy, but it was a motif that suited him politically. Now it doesn't take much to go through the actual history of the West to find that the mythology of the Wild West, of the rugged individuals, the cowboys who tamed the West, who defeated the, the savages, the Indian people, again, staples of the mythic version, that all of this was really more to be found between the uh, pages of the dime novels and later the Hollywood westerns than the actual pages of western history. There are many ways to, to show this, but one of the simplest and one of my favorites, because I used to reside in Nevada and grew up in the Reno and Carson City area, is this example from Virginia City. A few years back, some archaeologists began digging around in the western city of, of Virginia City, uh, a mining town from the 1870s silver mining boom era that likes to depict itself now to tourists as a genuine Wild West uh, town. Here you see this character standing in front of the Mad Dog Saloon. As a kid, I, I purchased a facsimile newspaper from Virginia City that had the custom printed headlines reading Chris Paget outshoots Billy the Kid. So I invested myself in the Western mythology and was quite excited by it as I played cowboys and Indians with my friends. Uh, I could feature the newspaper to boast of my credentials. Uh, but alas, as it turns out, the experts have shown all this to be a bit over overblown. The Saloon of the Wild West is an icon that has captured the imaginations of generations of Americans. From gunfights and dime novels to brawls and movies, the saloon provided a setting for stories about a young nation's conquest of the frontier. But as it turns out, upon further investigation, digging through the actual layers of Virginia City's history and uncovering artifacts, the, the variety of bottles, dishes, glasses, and gaming devices revealed the Virginia City saloons to be centers of society and commerce rather than the arenas for deadly showdowns between ruffians, as often portrayed in books and movies. Well, say it ain't so. Do you mean to tell me that Virginia City, with its rollicking Wild West reputation, that the real 
inhabitants of the boomtown era of Virginia City wish to be remembered and wish to be seen not so much as as rough around the edges frontiersmen but as refined genteel and even sophisticated in their ability to refashion polite society even in the very midst of their saloons with fine china lead glass crystal and all the finest uh, commodities you might say that could be purchased from the Eastern markets and so it leaves us with a fundamental question gee if the Wild West didn't actually exist even in a place like Virginia City then where did it exist and what I'm going to suggest is that it existed mostly between our ears that is mostly in our imaginations with images gleaned from dime novels and Hollywood Western and television westward, westerns. Okay, so that completes the first part of our lecture on the mythic landscape. Now we're going to turn in the next video lecture to an actual event from the late 1800s, an event that would launch America now as a global imperial power called the Spanish-American War. And one of the things that we're going to try to understand is how and why the elements of that mythic Western landscape only tenuously connected to the actual history of the West, but somehow fundamental to American character, as Frederick Jackson Turner put it. How it now began to define and shape our view of ourselves as a global imperial power. So we'll rejoin you for part two of the mythic landscape.